So Daniel, welcome. Hello. <laughs> How are you? Not too bad, thanks. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. I like your display in Thank the background. You. Thank you very it's much. Nice. I thought I'd make an effort. And congrats on a beautiful, beautiful portfolio in the magazine as well. Looks really amazing. Yeah, well done to all the team. It was, yeah. Have you seen it yet? Oh yeah, it's right here. <laughs> oh, there it is. Yeah, you know, Foam is an organization that has a, a great kind of backlog of, of projects and collaborations that it's a, it's a real privilege for, for this work to be in that, in that archive um, and for it to be treated so respectfully and um, in such an engaged way. So Daniel, thanks for making the time to talk to us about your work, Iperi Intera. It's a series uh, that has formed itself or that you've formed over the course of six years, I think, the past six years um, in Sicily, Italy, where a lot of refugees uh, arrived. Can you like take us back to that initial urge for you to go there and to photograph uh, that place and those people? I, since sort of 2013 and 2014, had started to become more and more aware of images of overcrowded um, boats in the Mediterranean Sea um, carrying large numbers of people from North Africa, primarily to southern Italy, um, either Lampedusa or Sicily. As sort of time went by, my awareness of these in images really crescendoed in 2015 when two migrant vessels capsized in the space of a week in April, early April 2015, um, claiming an, an, at the time an estimated 1,000 lives. Um, a, a while after it was reported that it could be more along the lines of 750 lives. However, um, there was a real spike in the media coverage in the UK surrounding migration in general and um, some opinion pieces were published in major news outlets um, that used vocabulary such as cockroaches um, to describe the people that attempted this type of journey into Europe. As the son of migrants myself, my parents migrated from uh, northwest Spain into the UK in, in 1970, um, I took the kind of language and ultimately xenophobic attitudes that were being printed quite personally. Um, a further backdrop to this was the approach of Brexit, uh, the Brexit vote. And again, migration was a, top, a political topic really mobilized to petition for a departure from the EU and subsequently a lot of the media narrative was very charged with a negative sentiment um, which again I took personally. You, This is a it seems like a very personal project in more than one way because you also actually went there for a longer period of time. I think you lived um, on, in Sicily for two years, I'm yeah, correct? Yes, so from uh, May, June 2017 until February 2019, uh, myself and my partner Jade Morris, who also collaborates with me on this work, um, moved there permanent, well, permanently. And initially it was supposed to be a three month um, project as I had received um, funding from the Magnum Foundation um, but at the end of that three months we realized that there was a, a huge amount of work that needed to be done there and we were valuable to the community beyond a photographic journalistic documentarian discipline. Um, we if, more or less became like social workers at a reception center, um, which was a home to 12 unaccompanied minors that had been rescued in the Mediterranean Sea. Um, 
It's a, it's a reception centre that had been open for 10 years and had looked after over 350 um, unaccompanied minors until their you know, 18th birthday where they would move into adult reception centres in the region or in different parts of Italy. Um, so we were there for the end of that um, time where the building was being used. It, it closed down in mid-2019, coinciding with um, political leadership in Italy that had started to prohibit migrant rescue ships being um, permitted access to Sicilian and Southern Italian ports. Um, so these centres had their funding cut and um, ultimately needed to close. Um, so that's when we moved back to the UK. And you, you didn't really stop there because after the centre closed and after the boys that you met there turned of age, you kept following them, uh, kept in touch with them, you know, kept uh, photographing them in some cases, even went back to their uh, home country. What made you invest so significantly uh, in, in this situation and in these boys? It's, um, it's, it's a very difficult question to answer um, because to a certain extent, like I mentioned before, the, the, the greater work is taking place away from the photography. And it's there that, you know, my relationships with people are very personal and they mean more than just a body of photographic work. Um, so there is a real pull um, on, a, on a personal level to stay in touch and offer support to people and I think in some ways one of the bigger pictures of the body of work is is about active citizenship which I think is a, a real key. Um, I'm not doing this to try and raise awareness for a cause. I think it goes beyond that and enters more a space of witnessing and understanding how our European society is working in certain sections where certain individuals and communities are extremely repressed and suffocated from basic societal systems of care. You know, more precisely, one of my main considerations in 2017 when we um, you know, received funding from the Magnum Foundation to go and work at the Zingali Centre was to really pay attention to mental health, in particular PTSD, because 99.9% .9 of the individuals that I've worked with since 2015 have all endured multiple incidents of trauma, um, which um, the more I stumbled through this subject and the more research I um, conducted, you know, I found out statistics such as it can take up to seven years for an incident of trauma to reveal itself psychologically in an individual. So um, if I give a list of examples of what people I've worked with have gone through, they have crossed the Sahara Desert on the back of pickup trucks uh, in unbearable heat with minimal water, food and water for days on end. Um, witnessed individuals fall off these trucks and be left in the desert. The intense criminality and dangers of um, Libya, uh, a country that's been dealing with civil war for a number of years where the boys I've been working with have been held in captivity as you know having been kidnapped um, have been bought and bought and sold as slaves witness people be murdered in front of their eyes to then cross the, the Mediterranean Sea in completely unsafe uh, vessels um, that in some cases have capsized and people around the boys have drowned or they have been lost at sea for days on end 
uh, entering states of hallucination, um, ultimately to arrive um, in rural Sicily, um, which in itself is a place of um, infrastructural deficit, um, aging populations, extremely rural environments, um, and a lack of you know, employment opportunities. So there is also an extremely powerful culture shock for the arriving community, um, which rarely gets considered. So if we just start with that as a, a level of lived experiences that in, in the particular case of this work, children are harboring, um, I think it's very important to look at the issues that might come up from this situation in a calm, pragmatic and sensitive way, um, rather than continuing to perpetuate and create, you know, binary arguments for and against migration. Um, you know, ultimately, for most of us that go to the supermarket and might be purchasing tomatoes from Italy, the likelihood is that they may have been picked by, um, you know, exploitative labour. Um, so there really is, um, I think, a huge social responsibility to engage in a more delicate and focused way on the issues that arise through migration because they affect everybody. Um, yeah, your the concern for the the mental state and uh, well-being of these boys that really translates to your photographs as well. I think you know they're of a very introspective, contemplative quality uh, versus the sort of immediacy that is embedded in, I don't know, uh, news, news footage that uh, reaches us every day. So it has a, it has a slower pace and a very, uh, a quieter, uh, I guess, aesthetic than the sort of regular photojournalism surrounding this subject. And I was interested to hear um, when we spoke before that you also collaborate with these boys to make um, you know, moving images or photographs that aren't of a moment in time or, you know, reenacting um, something that happened to them, but immerse you into uh, their mind somehow or try to transport you to a more, more of a dreamscape, I suppose. So I'm interested in, in learning more about how you kind of collaborated with the subjects. Uh, I guess that's not a good word, but... Yeah, well, um, I mean, it's fair that you raise that. I mean, I, I don't consider anyone in the pictures as subjects. I think the subject is migration and the individuals in the images are to a greater or lesser extent collaborating, um, not just with me, but with the idea of what the work is about. Um, I also really think it's important on, on a primary level to think about these as personal pictures that, um, you know, don't necessarily have any ownership. The individuals and the images that, you know, they are for them primarily, then, you know, they can be used and worked in different ways to provide perhaps more of a political message, a historical, in, uh, you know, message, as you described before, an archival quality. I think, um, you know, perhaps over optimistically, but my deepest hope for this body of work is that eventually it, it can reach a, a truly democratic quality in the sense that everybody involved has the same vision and, and ideas with the work. Um, and it can be less about, you know, the photographer. It's more about that collaboration and that the ideas that have been presented and individuals, I think, is the real key. And again, it's been the same motivation since the very beginning of this project, that those mass crowd shots that are used um, in the political sphere, in the media sphere to create fear and uncertainty in the viewer and also 
most importantly, to traumatize the viewer into a way of thinking about these moments. To zoom in and really connect with individuals and subsequently we start to realize that we have many things in common. Yeah, when we were going through your your project uh, and the material that you shot over the years, um, we you also accumulated footage that was shot by the boys themselves on their mobile phones sent to you, um, but also, you know, uh, footage, newsreel footage in which they featured over the course of six years. So you really feel like you're sort of piecing together their journey through, um, you know, from the crossing to into Europe. And even when they come of age, you know, you, you keep following them um, afterwards when they left the center. Um, so it, I really feel like you're sort of trying to um, follow the individual paths of them um, through Europe. And you really start to get to know the individual people behind those you know, news images of boats full of, full of people. So that's, to me, that's also where the, the strength of the project really lies in those individual stories. Yeah, I think so. And um, I, I feel um, motivated by that because I think each and every single person that I've worked with has an unbelievable amount of sensitivity and intelligence and vision and can contribute a really, really valid statement and ideas to the reality that they're facing. It's also an ongoing body of work, so there are no real conclusions that have been drawn. And I don't know necessarily if there need to be any conclusions. However, there is just a constant shift of people's realities um, that I think offer you the opportunity to sort of sit and consider the reality of how difficult individual lives are. In certain cases like Aliu, where myself and Jade visited his family in Senegal and used that audio to accompany a, a video portrait of him in Sicily um, to then subsequently receive video footage that he had made where he was sleeping in a bus shelter in, in the middle of Spain in zero degrees in the depths of winter um, really almost shatters any illusions that that anything to do with migrating to Europe gives anyone an easy life. It certainly doesn't. The, most of the people I've worked with, their lives are just as difficult in Europe as they were in the nations that they just left. Ultimately, you know, there's a great deal to fight for with this work and a great deal of reflection about the society we are a part of as Europeans, how we treat our most vulnerable, um, and how much trust do we generate as a, as a wider community. Um, I certainly feel that the individuals I've worked with, the vast majority are extremely isolated and really taken advantage of by society. Um, when I think there is a greater generosity of spirit that could, you know, benefit all of us if we just didn't allow so much toxicity to, to come into our perception of things. And, that, and I think photography has a great responsibility to confront its own history, um, particularly now that wider society is becoming more and more and more conscious of our colonial history and how much that is still affecting our present day and how much it affects specific communities um, in the present day. And, you know, photography and image making has a responsibility in that space too. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a, a, a great deal more to be done. Um, these are small steps. It's uh, an ongoing long-term body of work that ultimately at some point can affect individuals into 
thinking more and not thinking differently, but thinking more and thinking in a more considered and conscious way um, about, you know, their surroundings and, and community. Thanks for sharing your story, your work with us and your time. Privilege. Thank it's been you. a pleasure talking to you. And um, yeah, let's continue the conversation. Yes, 100%.